You are listening to Cursed Murphy's podcast. Our guest, Rob Doyle. Rob Doyle is a writer from Dublin. His first novel, Here Are the Young Men, was published in 2014 by Bloomsbury in the Lilliput Press. It was selected as one of Hot Press Magazine's 20 Greatest Irish Novels 1916-2016 to 2016, and has just been adapted for the screen. Rob's second book, This is the Ritual, a collection of short stories, was published in 2016 to widespread acclaim. He's the editor of the anthology The Other Irish Tradition and In This Skull Hotel, where I never sleep. He's written for The Guardian, Vice, Sunday Times, Dublin Review, Observer and many other publications. And until recently, he wrote a weekly books column for the Irish Times, investigating the dusky depth of his book collection. Uh, Rob's new novel, Threshold, has just been published by Bloomsbury to much acclaim, and it recently topped the bestseller charts in Hodges, Vegas. Uh, Rob teaches on the MFA in creative writing at the University of Limerick, and he lives the rest of the year in Berlin. Tonight's episode was produced with the support of Wexford Arts Department and Wexford Library. Rob Doyle, welcome to Cursed Murphy's podcast. Thanks for having me, Peter. Threshold was launched a couple of weeks ago. How are you feeling about it? It couldn't have gone any better, really. Um, so, I think the first review started coming in about a week before the book was actually launched. So it was launched on the 23rd, and um, I woke up one morning and the reviews had already started coming in from The Guardian and stuff. They don't warn you, you just kind of wake up and it's there in your inbox or in your newspaper or, you know, if you're on social media, people are shouting at you. So, uh, to my great relief and happiness, they were kind of the greatest reviews I've gotten probably so far. It's my third book and it's probably been the biggest wave of uh, positive attention so far. So that, yeah, it led to a kind of high fairly much, and then the high of the launch and just that wave of publicity that came with it. Um, the level of trepidation was higher with this. I mean, we spoke in December and given that we, much of the nature of the book is autobiographical and some of it is borderline transgressive. Um, and there was an understandable apprehension about, about the book because of the kind of book it is. You're very much cracking open your rib cage and pulling apart the, the flesh and exposing a lot of stuff in it. So I wonder, was the was there more at stake prior to publication than with the other books? Yes and no. I feel that the nature of the stuff I write means there's always, there always feels like there's a lot at stake and there's a lot of skin in the game, even when it's not as overtly autobiographical as it is in Threshold. So even when I... I remember before Here Are the Young Men came out, my first novel, which was 2014, I remember having a similar trepidation feeling, okay, this is very much a classical first novel in that it's, um, okay, it was, you know, semi-autobiographical in some sense, but it was characters with made-up names and so on, whereas in Threshold it's a guy called Rob, you know, who's very similar in most ways to me. Whereas here, the young man was this very, um, it was characters and they were kind of interacting in this plot. But nonetheless, everybody, I knew that everybody who read that book would directly or indirectly learn a lot about me and a lot about my obsessions, weaknesses, flaws, um, terrors, as well as, you know, hopefully more positive stuff like that I could write etc um, well for but, people but, who haven't read it I mean it does it, it's it's quite open and, and naked about relationships uh, about the, the state of your psychology about a certain amount of neurosis and obsession and philosophy and travel and drugs it's it's it doesn't draw a discreet veil over very much yeah Tell me about the moment where you decide to call the narrator Rob. And <laughs> like, what kind of a leap is that? Yeah, it wasn't really a moment. It was more, like, like I said, right from the start, from my first book, I'm just, you know, every, you don't really choose your subject matter in a sense. I think we, we all 
kind of accept that as writers. You, you just have to go where your fixations, your obsessions and fascinations take you. And mine have always been really centered very quite intensely around these themes that you mentioned, around sex, sexuality, around the psyche, around isolation and um, human distress, etc. But also, um, I've always had an impulse to use the experiences and the materials of my own life as the basis for what I write. Like I said, I started out doing that in a somewhat more conventional manner where there were these masks and personae. But then by This Is The Ritual, my second book, which was short stories, already I was very much playing with and flirting with this idea of using somewhat of a more explicitly autobiographical style. There was a Rob Doyle character who would kind of flit in and out of those stories, and some of them purported to be kind of straight up autobiographical essays, which then had fictional elements laced through them. Some of them were kind of um, accounts of somebody who was very much like me, trying to write a book and then having some sort of crisis in the midst of it, and that crisis becomes the story rather than the book he's telling, etc. And so it's not that this decision to write a whole book from a, in a first person voice from it, from the consciousness of someone called Rob and who's very much like me. It, it didn't just come out of nowhere. This is definitely something that I've just been kind of going towards quite relentlessly. Uh, and so I started writing. So the first book, as I say, was published in summer of 2014. I wrote the first chapter of this book in the winter of that year. It's actually chronologically the first chapter in it. In, in, it's about magic mushrooms. It's kind of a semi essay about the history of magic mushrooms and certain other psychedelic, naturally occurring psychedelic plants, mixed with my own kind of story of, of my interest in these things. And I wrote that as an essay initially. And then as soon as I had it, I realized I was kind of onto a voice that was going to occupy my time and energy for the next few years. And it did. Um, I realized I wasn't very interested in creating these fictional, conventional fictional narratives at the moment. Um, I wasn't even that interested in reading them at the time. I was more interested in autobiographical writing. Something seemed to happen to me when I got into my 30s where I lost kind of the ability or interest in that kind of suspension of disbelief where I would, you know, somebody would create a whole world full of characters. I just wanted to read about people's intimate experience of consciousness and of life, of being alive and their trials, their uh, adversities and all of that stuff. And so it just was very natural that I would go down that path. It's a difficult book to describe to people and I don't mean conventionally, I don't mean the boundaries between what is fiction or what is autobiography or what is travelogue. I mean in terms of its tone. So I find that if I outline this book to older male readers or to female readers, their reaction can be very much, oh, that sounds like a young man's thing for me. I'm not, I can't be doing with that kind of bravado. I'm done yeah. with Bukowski and Hunter S. Thompson and all that stuff. Yeah. It's very hard to convey the vulnerability in it and the unsureness and the depth of, of thought and, and, and I suppose the good old human pain and suffering that is actually in it. It's a way less a work of bravado than it might seem from even, a, even a, an accurate blurb on the back. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that had I produced a book which was just a kind of unreconstructed you know, binge of sex and drugs and stuff, it wouldn't be interesting to anybody, least of all to me, without that other side. You know, even the, the, the epigraph, the quote at the beginning from, it's from the filmmaker Gaspar No, and he says, even if it's often a question of getting high, it's not a work about getting high, but it's about something else. It's about existence and consciousness and the struggle 
to be alive. I mean, it's a book full of humor and joke. I'm talking about it in these very somber, serious ways. It's a book full of jokes and humor and all of that. But, uh, but it's really going after a bigger quarry than bravado and, uh, it, I mean, I, I guess, like I said, when you, you, you know, you don't choose your subjects, I've always written about the stuff that's most really disturbing to me, terrifying to me, unsettling. So I'm really always going after my own monsters, you know, demons, um, and trying to confront them or trying to make sense of them in some as visceral, as honest, as um, skillful a way as possible. And I think, yeah, if somebody described this to me, this book to me, I would probably have exactly the same doubts that your friends uh, would have had, you know, another book about this and that. It's not, it's not what we need, but it just isn't that book, you know? And I think people, I think people have very, people have realized that and uh, that's what's been really gratifying about the response to it so far, actually. And this includes reviewers, but it also just includes people who've read it mm -hmm. and have talked to me about it or who contacted me online. A lot of what they've responded to is not the more, as you say, transgressive elements of it. It's not the, it's not the bravado, it's that, um, exploration of anguish, of vulnerability, of um, suffering, you know. Were people always telling you to lighten up as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say as a teenager, yeah, yeah, it may never happen. I remember that phrase coming at me, like, it may never happen. And I would say, no, it did happen. It already happened. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think my, it my, is? My, parent, my mother tells me I was this really cheerful, smiley kid, which I'm, I, I, I don't know, she may have airbrushed history in her, in her own <laughs> mind. That's what she tells me. That's not necessarily a, a darkness, but there's a sense that, you know, you're missing a layer of skin over the nerves. Yeah, yeah. Um, my father used to quote Julius Caesar to me. He would say... Um, let me have men about me who are fat, sleek-headed men such as sleep at nights. Yon Casca has a lean and hungry look. Such men are dangerous. Wow. Yeah, yeah. My dad would only quote Bob Dylan. Oh, <laughs> Dylan's better, but anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, I suppose, yeah, if we're going to be honest about it, as, as a kid, even as a teenager, I would say I was unhelpfully oversensitive, let's say. It's not particularly helpful. I'm sure I'm not the first person who has said this, but it's not a particularly useful way to be. It's not a good thing to be in the world. Mm. But then, of course, if you become a writer, it's a very useful uh, thing, attribute, skill to have. So I guess I was doomed to end up as a writer. How are you with girls? Did you have uh, an ease with? With, uh, no, far, far, far from it, far from an ease with girls. When I was younger, uh, qu quite the opposite. Whatever is the opposite of an ease to girls, I had that in abundance. I, I was uh, the Don Juan of anti-ease with girls, let's say. <laughs> uh, the Casanova. Um, no, that, that, you know. Yeah, I guess like so many things in life, you know, you get better at some things as you get older. Um, and maybe that was one of them for me. Well, describe um, where you were born and where you grew up. You, were, you grew up in Crumlin, right? I grew up in Crumlin. I was born in the Coombe. I grew up in Crumlin. That's, um, you know, suburb of South Dublin. It's funny, South Dublin has a reputation for, you know, people say that's like posh Dublin, but they're thinking of other parts of Dublin, not Crumlin, not Drimna. I went to school in Drimna Castle, just down the road. Grew up in Crumlin, famous now for crime gangs, you know, mm. Kinahan, Kinahan Cartel, all that stuff is kicking off around there, you know, blood on the streets and stuff, but I was never a gangster. Um, no, so I grew up there, 
and my parents still live there. My older brother lives just 10 minutes down the road. Um, I kind of, I remember years ago reading an interview with John Banville and he, whatever part of Wexford he grew up in, I remember him saying he didn't even learn the names of the streets because he was so sure that as soon as he came of age, he was going to leave it. I was a bit like that with Crumlin, you know? Yeah. I, he, there, there could be a street 50 meters from where I grew up and I couldn't tell you the name, but probably even now, frankly. Although I go back a lot. Um, Did you keep quiet about your more esoteric interests for fear of being called a pretentious kid? <laughs> No, I didn't, because I don't think I really had those esoteric interests as a kid. I was just a pretty normal kid, I suppose, into, you know, video games, playing football and stuff. It was a fairly tough area to grow up, and I wasn't tough, so that made it kind of difficult, you know. Um, the esoteric interests, let's say, and the kind of rebellion and all of that stuff, uh, the nihilistic anger came very, and classically, you know, it came in adolescence and mm. I was not shy about expressing it um, or about embodying it in terms of all the, you know, tick the boxes of adolescent cliches. I was that, you know, I was the, the, the punky, <laughs> troubled, artistic, bookish teen. Um, what were you angry at? You name it. Yeah, you name it, everything, really. Um, I don't think I was angry at anything, I was just angry. Yeah. Um, full of rage, yeah. And then I got into the art, the music, that fueled that, that kind of met that, you know. Uh, we've talked before about like stuff like the Manic Street Preachers, punk, you know, early original punk, and Nirvana, grunge, all that stuff. So. And then that leads you, of course, into literature. You know, I didn't, so I grew up in this t totally working class household um, where I had parents who were very respectful of, let's say, of culture, you know, of books, of literature, of art, um, and encouraging of it, actually, but not really in it themselves. You know, they were not like well educated people. They were. My dad worked in the post office his whole working life. Um, so it wasn't like this bookish household. So you can't, I think I, I know I'm one of thousands of people, I'm sure, in Ireland, in the UK and stuff who've had this experience. But as a kind of working class youngster, you tend to need a way in to, let's say, high culture that isn't high culture itself. Yeah. And for a lot of us, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the same experience with you. The way in was music, mm. you know, the bands you listen to, if they're kind of, if they're a bit pretentious, so I like a bit of pretentiousness because it's, it's kind of aspirational, you know, if they're kind of artistically pretentiously inclined, they'll often quote authors in their interviews and they'll talk about the books they've read and so on. And then there's your reading list. You go off and read that, and suddenly you're forming this worldview and you're becoming um, more defined as a person, you're becoming more, your anger and aggression have a focus and they have a structure and the beginnings of a kind of critique and you begin, that anger isn't diffuse and at quite as just wantonly destructive anymore, it's focused into some kind of way of looking at the world where you think it could be better than this, you know, I could look better than this, I could have more than this and so eventually you come around to starting to create your own art, yeah. your own music, your own writing. It was, there are some very interesting things, obviously Lou Reed and David Bowie and you know, all that generation of name droppers, brilliant name droppers. Yeah. Um, so it resulted in things like, you know, I was, I was discussing and arguing and debating Jack Kerouac for a good 10 years before I read a word of him. Um, <laughs> You know, it's like, yeah. and it was almost like a patch on your jacket. <laughs> and I Iggy, Iggy would always quote Nietzsche, probably the first I ever heard about Nietzsche, who became a huge kind of writer, still is for me, Yeah, was through reading interviews with Iggy Pop. You know, he would always, he, I think he went through a real Nietzsche phase, so yeah. 
Also, I remember David Bowie. Here's a great quote from David Bowie. I went to that uh, David Bowie v &A. You remember that show that was at the v &A that yeah. then went kind of touring? Yeah. This incredible retrospective of Bowie's career. And it was, a, I think it was an audio clip of him saying, you know, yeah, when you, you, he was this kind of young, again, quite pretentious guy, and he said he'd carry around these books, you know, just to have them in his pocket so they'd stick out. And people would think, wow, look at David, he's reading those great books. But then he said, the thing is, sometimes you actually pick up the books and start to read a bit of them, and therefore you get into it. Uh, so whatever brings you to the feast is fine. The title here are The Young Men Comes From Where? Comes from Joy Division, yeah, right. So from the song Decades by Joy Division. Uh, I can't remember the last time I listened to Joy Division, but you know, the, I guess that that book had that kind of tone that they... <laughs> I think even more so maybe a story like No Man's Land from This Is The Ritual, which is a pretty graphic dissection of a season in, um, in hell to go Rambo. It's about, explicitly about depression. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder, was there a cause, or is there a cause for those episodes? Does it come from experience? Or is it chemical imbalance, or is it the result of any particular origin? Have you figured it out any better as you get older? Yes and no, because it's all fiendishly complex. I think some people uh, do just have a certain chemical imbalance, you know, in their brains. And I'm no expert, you know, but from what I understand, some people just have depression as a severe illness that they'll be fighting all their lives because of some sort of chemical imba imbalance. I'm not sure that was necessarily the way with me. And um, that's one of the, so, so many of the stories in This Is The Ritual are kind of comic, you know, they're, they're full of a kind of flair and even a kind of bravado and arrogance and a, a, a aggression and stuff. Um, but that's, that one is, that one has no real humor in it at all. Mm. I think it's one of the most, um, quite proud of that story actually, because I think it's a very severe, uh, pretty, I think it's a fairly intense descent into the, exactly the stuff that you're talking about. Um, it's very difficult in a story to convey somebody's existence where they have no appetite and they have no joy and they have no levity and there's no colour, it's a very grey landscape, without actually depressing the reader. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it isn't, it, if you go into, into that, if you go down that direction, you make that classic kind of aesthetic category error where you think creating depression, or like creating boredom in the reader is, is the quarry. It's not the quarry, you know. You, you, if you're, you don't want to bore your reader if you're going to explore boredom. You know, you want to make the experience of boredom interesting. I yeah. think it's the same with anguish, depression, all of that stuff. I would, I think, who was it who said, achieved art is never depressing, it's never deflating, you know? W which is to say, you can have art which goes to the very darkest places of experience, of consciousness, of the psyche, and explores it rigorously but it's not it's not if it's achieved art it's not ultimately just gonna leave you hollowed out and emptied you're gonna take something from it you're gonna be somehow challenged sure shaken up sure but you're gonna come out of it somehow it's like in the shamanic tradition i often think about this you have this experience of dismemberment uh terrifying you know that before they become the shaman they become they undergo this ordeal where they be, they get ripped apart in some kind of hallucinatory vision quest, ripped to pieces, viciously, savagely. Um, annihilation of the self, of mm. the ego. But it, it doesn't stay there. It's so that something more powerful, more radiant can be recreated in its place. So I, I guess my hope for art is that it does something similar like that. Maybe to the artist as well as to the to the audience. Well, in talk therapy, like psychotherapists uh, will regard writing your experience as crucial to getting better. Mm -hmm. 
So is there some sense that as you're operating out of a place of suffering, the very act of writing allows you to get out of your own existence for a while and that grants you some sort of relief from the relentlessness of your own inside of your own head? Yeah, some, somehow yes. I mean, I find it... I don't... I, I'm wary of using the word therapy because I'm not convinced that it is therapeutic. I think that when it's over and done with, you're kind of left with the same problems that led you there in the first place, and yet something does happen. I find the whole endeavour, on one hand, extremely difficult, but on the other hand, incredibly meaningful and rewarding for that reason that you've just expressed. I think it's not so much that it solves the problems, and this is a kind of realisation I've stumbled towards lately, is that I don't think it really does solve the problems. <laughs> you know, the problems that kind of led you to the desk in the first place. I think it's that the experience of turning them into something, of sublimating them actually, you know, of turning this kind of base material of confusion, torment, whatever it might be, into something, something communicable, something beautiful even, even if it's a kind of dark, gnarled beauty. That's just so rewarding and meaningful, personally, that it kind of does, it does somehow redeem some of that stuff. But also, I think it's the fact of, I was talking to somebody about Leonard Cohen recently, and you know, even a cursory familiarity with his work would leave kind of any listener pretty sure that they were in the presence of the work of a guy who'd been through a lot of stuff in his life and that somebody who was more or less in constant battle with his own demons. But I think, and again, I don't think it's that he used the art to solve those problems, but that dialogue that's created by having an audience essentially you know, by realizing you can turn these struggles into a kind of drama and then turn that, that drama is a kind of art, whether it's music, whether it's literature, whether it's poetry, whatever the case is, that kind of struggle. Because everyone else, even if they don't create art, you know, even if they're accountants or barmen or whatever the case may be, they're also involved in their own life or death struggle, you know? because that's what it is to be alive. And so you start to do that and you start to create the art and then this dialogue begins whereby people are witnessing it, the art. And I think that's where the, the relief comes in. Mm. I think that's where the, the, re the redemptive quality of it comes in. It's almost like that old joke about, you know, I went to Florida and all I came back with was this shitty t-shirt. It's like the flip of that. It's like I went to hell, but I came back with this book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, a season in hell is this Rambo, you know. Um, he brought it back, you know. How, if somebody close to you in your life comes to you and says, Rob, I can't eat, I can't get out of bed, like, I'm, I've, I've got nothing here. What do you say? What do you say to them? I don't know. I. I don't know. I just try to be supportive. You know, there are, there are plenty of people in my life who. Go through stuff like that. Actually, you mentioned this story, No Man's Land. Um, that's probably one of the very few pieces of fiction that I ever felt guilty about because the very disturbed narrator meets this character on this housing estate who's this kind of broken, destroyed person, older, you know, 20 years older. And that, was, that guy was very explicitly based on a person I know, a painter who lives in a mental institution in Dublin, a, a friend of many years called Paul, and uh, it was very clear to everyone that it was based on him, and I felt a kind of guilt 
around that because it was a very painful story and I guess I was kind of exposing some of his secrets which I'd never done before and I'm not really, you know, it's a very, ethically it's a, it's a minefield, it's a very mm -hmm. tricky, um, but then I ended up writing about him in a non-fictional way in this book and actually dedic partially dedicating the book to him. Um, I met him yesterday. I was, uh, in that very Dublin way, I was just walking along. He was standing outside a bookshop with a, with a copy of my book. So we went for a coffee. But um, my point being that I kind of feel like writing has allowed me to escape from that destiny of destruction, you know, uh, to an extent. <laughs> writing is what I used to reflect on all of this stuff to such an extent that you get a bit of distance on it and then you kind of become something in the world but you're still, it's still a case of there, but for the grace of God, go I. You're still, you still know, you meet somebody like that, and you still know that could very easily be me, or anybody I met. So I guess that, it's just a getting older thing as well. I think as you get older, you just, you do become a bit kinder somehow, because maybe you're less embattled yourself. You have that bit more sp space, to give a bit of room, a bit of compassion to other people. So I guess I just do what everybody does in that circumstance, which is try to be there for somebody. I can be very, at times, savagely pessimistic in my books. Maybe not so much in this one. I think this is a book with a real undertone of a kind of hard-won optimism in it, actually. But in my personal life, I tend not to be I tend not to try to inflict that on other people in my personal life, you know? Um, How do, I mean, there are several relationships documented in the book. Um, and they're, <clears throat> you know, they're hair-raising escapades. There's a rather glorious um, orgy sequence in, a, in, a Ber in the subterranean Berlin nightclub. Um, there are all these experiences how are the people close to you? Do, are they looking at you funny now since the book came out? A little or, bit, yeah. Right? Does it come up with, with people who are close to you? Yeah, it does. Um, I think it's quite telling that unless things have changed, this is the one book that my parents haven't actually read yet. And I think it's because of just, it's uncomfortable if you know somebody, you know? Yeah. It's a, like, this is a very intimate book, and um, it, 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 yeah, it goes into some fairly fraught places and some like comically deranged places, like this Berlin scene and several others. Um, yeah, sent me to the Ben and Jerry's for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so, like Rob. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it can be difficult for the people around you to an extent, but. Um, well, joking aside, but the more kind of, you know, people who've been in your life for a period and you're describing oh, yeah. like a compressed well, graph of a relationship or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I kind of have a, you see, so I just talked about my friend Paul, this painter, and how I felt kind of quite ambivalent about having put him in a story in this very obvious way, but actually for the rest of the time I'm quite clear about that. I'm not here to throw other people under the bus. Mm. Myself, yeah, okay. You know, I can, I feel ethically, I can kind of make fun of myself, you know, send myself up, uh, expose difficult parts of myself. I can do that till the cows come home, but I don't feel, I don't want to do that to other people. I'm not in it for that, you know, it's not, so I kind of, I mean, I should also, you, you were right at the beginning, you did describe Threshold as a novel. The point being in that it should not be taken at face value as a memoir, as a straightforward account of things that happened, which is not to say that a lot of the things in the book uh, didn't happen. A lot of them did, even most of them did, but lots of other stuff has been changed or invented or stretched and um, 
so certain, certain facts, certain details have been warped so that I don't think there's going to be some ex I've had who's going to come out of the woodwork and say, I can't believe what it says on page 177, how could you? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not, there's nothing really like that in there. I, I say that, but... Do you, want to read a, do you want to read a passage from page sure. 177? <laughs> <laughs> this is from page 57. So this is from one of the kind of, in between the longer chapters, there are these letters to an kind of unseen uh, correspondent, which we learn a bit about as the book unfolds. It's another, it's a writer, it's a, it's a woman, older. I leave Croatia in the morning. The last time I lived in France, I came to pieces, grinding, distorted, obsessional thoughts, relentless paranoia. But circumstances were different then. I was living on my own after a breakup, and there were problems in my life that felt so severe I couldn't see a way out. You get spooked. You stop trusting yourself. Your brain becomes an enemy. But I think you know what I mean. I too used to have dreams of being swept away by the incoming tide when I was a child. Some of the dreams were sketched as in pencil. In some of them, my mother stood on the shore, helpless or impassive. Later, there were nightmares of a flood, black waters rising up to drown the world. The newspaper dropped me after that single column, and rightly so. I don't care whatever they required me to care about. They want someone with social concern, chronic indignation, a feel for the fluctuations of mass hysteria. Essentially, I accept the world as it is. This is where you and I are different. You exert yourself in making some small change for the better, even though you suspect that it's closing times in the gardens of the West. You believe that writing should concern itself with political action, a dutiful inching towards utopia whereas I feel insufficient loyalty or vigor and too much bitterness to align myself with these movements. Politics engage me purely as something interesting. I know this incenses you, yet here we are, still friends, sort of. It's been an interesting six or seven years and a, and a long journey between the writing of Here Are the Young Men to the writing of that book, you know, going from all that anger and all that nihilism and all that, uh, all that almost sort of nirvana type rage that's in the prose of the first book into a place of what is really interesting in the new book is it's touching on pure philosophy. You're talking about Buddhism, you're talking about. Uh, uh, we were talking about the Stoics a couple of years back and that idea that, you know, philosophy is not really what we thought it was when we were kids. It's actually bone hard and unforgiving. And it's it's a, a very strict set of unforgiving guidelines about how to live. Um, there's a question in there somewhere. It's something to do with age. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. It's something that we... We've broached the subject before, but I'd like to, to go a little deeper into it, which is you entered the publishing game still with remnants of youth. Mm. And it's that particular thing between 29 and 37, a lot of stuff happens. And we were talking about the first time that you look in the mirror and you kind of see a skull underneath the skin for the first time. And you're like, oh, God, mm. there's no repairing this now. Mm. Um, I wonder, is there a, any kind of... As a writer, is there a kind of a freedom in that now? It's, it's, you know, will you be a more comfortable little fella? I'm interested about the dynamic of that. Yeah, um, I guess I'm almost tempted to retread and partially take back something I said earlier, which was that the writing of it, you know, creating novels and stories and fictions that really go into these sorest places of the self and then turning them into books doesn't resolve the problems but and it's true in some sense that it doesn't but in another sense actually it does allow you to leave things behind um, 
and I've had that sense with every like you mentioned Buddhism and I, 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 I'm no Buddhist but I certainly um, engaged with it to a certain extent and I would have friends who are Buddhist and stuff and you know I find a lot of profundity and wisdom in that philosophy and in that way of looking at the self and life and so on and dying to oneself is a big thing in that tradition you know the death death is not always this negative thing it's kind of a transformative thing and something about books particularly ones that really go that go to the deep well of experience and come back up with something and turn it into some kind of form they do allow you to die to some uh, earlier incarnation of yourself I'm not talking about obviously I'm not talking about supernatural stuff I'm talking about in this life you know um, just before we just before I came here I saw a photograph someone sent me a photograph of a, a kind of profile they did of me in a magazine in I haven't seen I haven't read it yet it was in the Dublin Review, but the headline was A Reckoning. And I could just read the, the first paragraph, and it seemed to be the journalist, you know, it's obviously he's writing about Threshold, and he seemed to be, um, his take on it was that this book was about me, about the author, um, who's also, in a sense, the narrator, closing a chapter on a certain period of life, which is this, tumultuous, chaotic, uh, seemingly universally tumultuous, chaotic period, like you say, between 29, 30, late, you know, 37, whatever. The Increasingly 57, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and it is, um, it's, again, I have this feeling that I'm really overemphasizing the darker aspects of particularly this book uh, we're actually in the years that the years of life and a very raw rich experience that went into the creation of this book and it's so much travel and living in different cities and engaging with different ideas and philosophers yes yeah, sure lots of it was chaotic and turbulent and dark but there was also a hell of a lot of joy in it and lots of highs and there's lots of it's you know, lots of color in this book you know and lots of uh lots of the thrill of discovery actually um at the same time i definitely wouldn't want to be writing here or the young man you know part five when i'm in my 50s you know i like I've never, been, I've never wanted to be static as an artist. Like even some of the people we've talked about, th these other artists, be they musicians or whatever, they're always evolving. And so I want to write about what excites, what moves, what troubles me now, rather than being stuck in some past variant of myself. It's very interesting. It's almost uncharted territory now to see Patty Smith making records in her 70s or, you know, I suppose Johnny Cash would have been the one to kind of break that barrier and Leonard Cohen then followed him into it. Yeah, and some of their best work, you know, um, but in both cases. There's, a, I'm sure I've quoted this at length before, but there's a, a quote that I love of Leonard Cohen talking in an interview where he says that he somebody asked him about his depressions in his older ages and he said they've lifted he said mysteriously they've lifted and the interviewer said you know why do you think that is and he said well i've read that as you get older the brain cells associated with anxiety begin to die off <laughs> big question but let's conclude with it after you know we've reached this is a a, a fairly unfashionably mystical book is threshold I take pride in being a bit fashionable. I always have done. It's the, the contrarian in me. Uh, the film adaptation of Here Are the Young Men is imminent. You've actually acted. Your first role 
in, a, in an English film called Hit the North, was a, a leading role. Uh, you've always played music and been interested in visual art and operated in that area. So what is next? This, this feels like quite an epochal kind of book for you. So do you have any idea where you're going? Not really, which is interesting. It's not, um, it's not a particularly scary, terrifying place to be, at least not yet. Um, but because to a, I do wonder, after this book, it's a very, in its own way, as an artist, as a writer, there's no kind of coming back from a, a book like this because I've just put, I put it all out there in a sense, and I've kind of stripped away uh, so much of the kind of fictional scaffolding that I may have used in the past, mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's possible to go back to that kind of fictional apparatus, at least in the same way. So you just have to keep going forward. And I'm not entirely sure where that forward is just yet. Um, all I know is that I'm not somebody who tells stories for the sake of it. You know, I'm not a storyteller in that I, I you know, just for the telling of the tale. It's, it's, not, it's not what I got into writing for. Every book sort of been three so far and each one of them has pretty much come from the same place of I've meant every one of them and uh, I can only assume that it will always be that way you know which is to say that if I don't have something to say at a given time I won't be saying it and so there's a certain element of waiting around and just seeing what you know life is still going to happen and seeing what gathers into that kind of hard core of necessity that it seems to require for me to actually get to the table and spend two three years or, or however long it takes writing a book i do you know make music i do engage in, well, in film, in lots of other things. Colla I love collaborating. Uh, but all of those things are very much secondary. And I kind of suspect it will stay that way. You know, that what I'm best at is writing sentences and then writing paragraphs and eventually, hopefully, turning enough paragraphs into books. I think that's not only what I'm best at, it's where I feel this is the this is the thing, you know. So I don't I don't think that any of those other kind of artistic uh, engagements I, I go in for will take the four again, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough talent as a musician or in music for that to happen. It's a premature question in some ways, like you have to live more. I think yeah, I often think you know, it's like hunter gathering. You know, I'll tell you what it is when I've got a pile of sticks. Exactly. So I'm. Um, that's where I am now. I'm kind of gathering, and I think there's a certain amount of trust in the deeper self. Let's say oh, that sounds so bullshit, wishy-washy, pseudo mystical. But you know, the the unconscious. Let's say y you begin to trust in it, and you realize that actually that's filling up all the time, and you're changing all the time and I'm changing I feel these last few years have been years of radical change internally um, which is just how you would want it really how I want it anyway so I just want to see where that goes see what see what I'm led to create and maybe something completely different from the three books that have gone before who, who knows Rob Doyle thank you for joining us on Cursed Murphy's podcast Thanks for having me.